Thank you all for having us here today. Um, my name is Kara Dawson, and I am a quality improvement advisor for QSource, which is the quality improvement um, organization for the state of Indiana. And with me today um, is my son, Zachary Dawson, and he is a senior um, at Purdue University studying mechanical engineering. And we're just really excited to be here today to talk to everybody about the effects of substance use disorder on the family, me as the mom, and um, Zachary as a child growing up with someone who had a substance use disorder. For me, um, growing up, I, ha I had a very normal, um, great childhood. Um, uh, always looked forward to um, getting married, having children, um, kind of the white picket fence um, persona that everybody always dreams of. Um, I ended up meeting um, Tony um, when I was uh, 27 years old. Um, I had graduated from nursing school. I was working. I was a professional. I was, um, everything seemed great. Me and Tony had um, gone to high school together and we were friends in high school. For me, um, I noticed the substance use um, even before probably we were married, um, but chose not to, to take those red flags that I saw and thought that I could help him um, change. And so he was um, in the Air Force and um, was a part of Desert Storm and came back and found out very soon after he had come back that um, I was actually pregnant with Zachary. And that's when I noticed um, his substance of choice was um, alcohol um, and large amounts of alcohol. And that's when I noticed it getting worse is when um, he came back. So um, for me, everything was normal. I saw the substance use um, as a problem um, very early on. Then felt like that it was my duty um, as his wife um, and a soon-to-be mom that um, to help him and to get through this um, situation. I guess it was a part of my life from the moment that I was born. So to me, it was regular everyday life, him being that way. And I guess I didn't really realize it was any different than what, say, another kid would have until second, third grade. I remember, like, you go over to a friend's house and it's not that way, and it becomes apparent pretty quick that there's something going on, and you always kind of lived behind this wall where we were in this perfect little bubble, and no, we didn't want anybody to know that this was going on, and it, it always was. Some of the signs and symptoms that we noticed as I got farther into this relationship, we dealt with a lot of um, violence. Um, he was very physically abusive to me. He was mentally abusive to me and emotionally abusive. He um, felt like because of his job um, and his duty with the, um, in the military that it, now everybody owed him. Um, and so, like Zachary said, we kind of lived in this bubble. It was a very embarrassing for me as a professional person. Didn't want anybody to know, hey, um, when I go home, almost every night I'm getting beat up. And um, almost every night I'm going home and I have a sick feeling in my stomach because I know that he's been drinking. Um, it's almost paralyzing. So the no lights on in the house. Um, had to be quiet. We all got used to not drinking our drinks. We kind of laugh about it now, but we didn't get ice in our drinks because that might wake him up. And if we came and he came home and he had his rage once he was out, we were good. So it became a pretty consistent pattern. Um, and so that's really when I really realized um, that something was wrong um, and that this was way deeper than, than I even maybe had thought about. And the violence just kept escalating. Um, 
and I could see it affecting my children. Zachary being the oldest um, really kind of took on that protector role for everybody and really took on that father role for his two younger siblings and then relying on my parents who lived in town to um, help get him to school, help pick him up from school. Where are they gonna go? Because when I get the call at work that um, you're gonna bring me money now, even if it was the last $20 that we had, trying to deal with all of that and not wanting anybody else in the community, especially the people I worked with, to know because I had people coming to me in the same situation and I'm giving them advice. Um, you know, oh, he's not gonna hurt you if you leave, you need to get out of that, you need, and then feeling very hypocritical as I'm driving home, knowing what I'm driving home to. Looking back, um, we had very extensive workups um, through the VA when he came back from Desert Storm. He did some relief efforts um, in Bosnia and Somalia. And so we knew that there was some mental aspect happening with him when he came back. Um, initially, we couldn't get that mental health diagnosis, right? But I knew um, pretty early on just from my medical background that we were dealing with something um, above just substance use. And he would talk frequently about um, the alcohol um, took him away. He didn't have to think about things, right? But you know, the blinds being closed, no lights on. He had a bat at every entrance of, of the house. Um, very paranoid when um, planes would fly over the house. You couldn't approach him from the bat. Finally, um, pretty late into um, our marriage, he did get diagnosed with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I think the failure in, in my mind was that I, I can't help him. Um, as much as I try to control the situation, the more out of control it was. Um, and even with that diagnosis and him being on the medications for post-traumatic stress, it's hard to get them to go into those appointments. So if he's drinking at least every other day, he's not gonna make it there. There was a lot of mental health issues that um, for him and along the way, um, mental health issues probably for me as well. You can't leave me because I'm, you know, if you leave me, I'm gonna kill you. Um, I'll find you, I'll take the kids, you'll never find us. Um, so it was um, for me, keep, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, and really started feeling like that he was that enemy in my life. He was a great guy to everybody else out on the street, right? Um, and no one would know. Did I see it as a disease when I was in the thick of it? No. Um, because what I heard so many times, you are the one that isn't being reasonable. Um, maybe not. Maybe I wasn't, but um, living in that situation, I need someone, I need someone on my side to say this is what you need to do. Um, and that isn't what, that isn't what I got in it, maybe because we were within a system that very much caters to servicemen and women, which rightfully so, but can't forget the families that they're, you're sending them back to. I needed to be more prepared um, for, for what I might encounter. Sometimes I have to check myself even today to say it is a disease process um, and be more understanding because when you live it, it makes you angry and kind of callous. So I didn't have that support and part of it's my fault because I didn't want anybody else to know. It was an embarrassment for me um, and I thought it made me look weak. Um, I wanted people to think that my house was happy um, and everything was normal when really it was very dark and gloomy. As a kid, I, I think the things that I saw um, 
number one was we were always trying to not be at home when we were home. I mean, as I got older and started realizing, it became obvious pretty quick that there were things that were being hidden. Um, there was always, I mean, the alcohol was always tried to be hidden, but it, it became hard because if he left, we came home, it's all around the house. So, and it became really apparent really quick that it wasn't um, the same as what other kids had, especially as I got older. I feel like I did kind of take on that protector role because as I started becoming cognizant of the fact that it's going on and I'm realizing what it is, of course, I don't want my little brother and little sister to feel the way I feel or see what I see, kind of in the same way that mom was. So I was getting up in the morning, making sure people were getting ready. Grandma came and took us to school because mom's at work. Dad's passed out. You don't want to wake him up. So I'm the one getting up. I'm the one doing things that I guess, to be fair, kids my age probably weren't doing. I, I think it changed who I was early on. I mean, it affects you. It affected me socially because now I'm, I feel like I matured. I was somewhere up here and kids around me, they aren't worrying about what I'm worrying about at home. So I can't relate to like, this kid lost his Pokemon card. I'm going home trying to keep my little brother and little sister from seeing things that are going up, going on at home. And looking back on it, it's different than what it felt like then because then it was just, you wanted him to go away. You didn't, you wanted it to be normal. You knew that it was possible for it to be normal, but you knew that he had to go away. And I mean, there's, there's times where you get pretty dark in your mind about, especially as a kid, I mean, about him going away, mm -hmm. whatever it took for him to go away and wanting, wanting it to be normal. And sometimes it felt like that wasn't ever going to happen. The stigma for me that, um, maybe I was so concerned about <laughs> is um, number one, um, I was a nurse. Um, I'm supposed to be a strong person. I'm a mom. Um, I'm a protector of my kids. Um, I don't want people to know that my house is not running like it should be in my mind, right? Um, I don't want people to know that my husband is abusing me and I'm staying. Um, what's going to happen if um, I leave and something happens to me? And then there would be those days that he wasn't drinking, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Um, and he was the person that I knew that I had met that I knew I wanted to be with. And how can I leave him? If I leave, do I look like the bad guy now that I've left? Someone who is going through this um, and I'm supposed to be able to help people I'm a nurse medical I how come I can't help him I help all these other people how come I can't help him maybe it is me maybe when he tells me it's me it is me I didn't want people to see me as weak um, I didn't know that I needed help when you're in the thick of it I don't know that you really know that you need the help that and if I get help, does that also make me not look like I'm in control and that I'm strong? Um, never mind that. And when I guess when I was in the situation, um, to go and get the help meant that I knew I was going to go home and reap a repercussion from him because he didn't want people to see him in that light either. I guess it was always an excuse. Um, but I do think there's a huge negative sti uh, stigma in our society about substance use disorder. Um, they're no good. They're not, you know, they're not going to get any better. And why would she stay? Um, it's her own fault, right? Um, and after I was with him for 14 years, um, and I finally knew that I had to make that break, um, and I did so, but. It was humbling. I had to go live with my parents again. I had three kids um, who, after I left, I realized that they were much more affected by that substance use 
than what I even knew at the time. There was a huge amount of guilt for me, um, thinking that I wasn't I wasn't the mom I needed to be maybe, but knowing that in the thick, if I left, in my mind, how can I leave? I know that he's gonna, I'm gonna have to let the kids go and see him. And the thought of them being with him by themselves was worse to me than what I thought I was doing to try to protect them at the time. When I was really in the thick of um, the the whole process and 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 in that life that I really even knew that I needed the help but looking back I was really just enabling a situation to continue to spiral out of control growing up I mean when when I was that age we didn't talk about it he was around once in a while just enough to pull off the facade that mm -hmm. That he was around, he was normal, me knowing well in the back of my mind that that's absolutely not how it was, and we didn't talk about it, we hid it. People didn't come over, and I don't know that I ever had any friends that said anything about not coming over to our house, but I knew that, I knew why, so it didn't, didn't ever strike me as odd, I guess, growing up that nobody came over, because... I don't guess I would felt like growing up I was at home that often. <laughs> so it wasn't odd to me to not be at home. So yeah, I mean, looking back at it now, um, obviously I, I left the situation. Um, probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. The scariest thing I've ever done in my whole life, hands down. Um, hum most humble thing I've ever had to do, live with my parents for a summer. I f you know, you feel like, you're a kid again, but also a mom, and now my kids are listening to my parents more than they're listening to me, because um, my dad kind of was that father figure for them for a minute. Um, but looking back now, obviously, I see things much differently, because not in that situation, I'm not fearful anymore. Um, would I have done things differently? Absolutely. Do I have guilt every day of my life? Absolutely. I wish I would have left way before um, I did. And then part of me says if I would have left too early, then I wouldn't have all three of my children, right? Um, which were the biggest blessing ever. Um, but most certainly I wish that I would have gotten out of the situation, and most certainly I wish that my kids would have never had to be in that situation. And I can separate for him. In my mind, I, I get it's a disease. I get that it really wasn't who he was because I knew him before that, right? Um, I knew him before he had the substance use disorder. I knew him before the drinking. Um, so I do think that the mental health played a large part. Do I still have a little bit of anger and resentment? Probably. Um, has it gotten better? Absolutely. So after I left, the drinking continued, obviously, right? And um, he got into some more trouble. And um, unfortunately, um, he died. Um, a couple of years after um, I left. Um, and oddly, when that happened, um, it's kind of freeing. Yeah. You're sad. You're sad that he never got the help that he needed. But for, for, I think I can speak for me, Zachary, I think I can speak for all of us it was almost a relief that oh, we, we don't have to worry about um, if he drinks again. I don't have to worry about if he tries to come and break in our house when he's drinking. I don't have to worry about him stealing things from me anymore. Um, but sad all at the same time. I, don't, I, don't, I know it doesn't make a lot of sense 
but it, it it's kind of that combination feeling um, a little bit. Um, and so, you know, once we left and we moved away from our town, um, as a single mom with three kids who's never lived by herself before, it was scary. Um, but now, happily, at the end of the tunnel, um, uh, I remarried and they have that father figure that they always longed for. Um, and so I, I don't know. It, now looking back, would I have done things differently? Absolutely. Um, but I, I, you can't second guess because you do the best you can. I guess kind of on the flip side for me, there, for me, there was no separating him from the alcohol and there still isn't in my mind. To me, that is him. And I guess for the good or the bad, I, there were good days, sure, but to me, there were a lot more bad days. So you try to remember the good days, but to me, he's always, he will always be the person who abused alcohol and did what he did. And I mean, I second everything she said. It was him dying absolutely was, it's kind of a surreal feeling almost. You're sad that he's gone. For me, I was angry that, you know, you don't get the opportunity to talk to him about it as a grown person who can talk to him in that way. But um, at the same time, it's, it's freeing. So I think um, my, my biggest suggestion to someone who's in that and my biggest hope for someone who finds themselves um, in similar situations is that um, it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't make you look like a lesser person to go and get help. Um, get the help that you need. Reach out for help sooner rather than later. Um, it's not your fault. Um, you are worthy of having, having the help. And you can't change that person. That's the biggest thing. You by yourself, are, are you can't make a difference. That person has to make their own difference. Don't be fooled that you are um, protecting your children. Don't think that they don't see what's happening and they don't feel what's happening. Um, because from one mother to another or to a father or to whomever, they know more than you think and they sense more than you think and um, get them the help they need as well. My biggest thing, if there's a kid out there that is going through this, know that you're not the only one. I mean, because me growing up, you feel like you're the only one, you're on this island alone where you are different than everybody else and you are dealing with something different than everybody else. And I know now that there's other people out there that are going through it and know that it's okay to feel the way you feel about it. And that at the end of the tunnel, there's always light.